the residents of Krakow lived in fear during the 1960s of a vampire that stalked the ancient Polish city in search of victims to satiate his bloodlust. But Carol Kott was not the same type of creature of the night often associated with the vampiric tales from folklore, or the haunting figure from F. W. Murnau's silent movie Nosferatu. This vampire of Krakow was a knife-wielding maniac who preyed on the elderly and young alike. So fearful were citizens, that they dared not whisper the nickname given to the killer by the press, who became known as the Vampire of Krakow, a name that struck terror into people of all ages. After leaving two women wounded and a third dead, the vampire vanished for a 17-month period, before resurfacing to hunt younger victims. Arrested in June 1966, Kot was charged with two murders and executed for his crimes. The story of Carol Cott is not simply one of an impressionable and awkward teenager, confused at an ever-changing point in a young man's life, but that of an aberrant psychopath acting out his twisted fantasies of violence and murder. It is possible that Cott went on to become the inspiration for the serial killer Lucian Staniak, known as the Red Spider, who was most likely the literary creation and overzealous crime writer. The nightmare began on September 21, 1964, when on that day, a fledgling killer attempted to claim his first victim. Albeit unsuccessfully, the target of his rage was attending church that day, and as he would later describe himself in court, he planned to wait in the house of God for an elderly parishioner, a knife concealed in his coat. How annoying, he later exclaimed, no one showed up. It was only as he was leaving, frustrated at his missed opportunity, that he chanced upon an ideal victim. As 48-year-old Helene Velgen entered the church, she noticed a young man deep in prayer. When she knelt to pray, the young man pulled out a bayonet concealed in his jacker and drove a knife deep into her back. By aiming for her heart, he intending for the attack to be fatal. The maniac had stabbed the woman several times in the back, and seriously injured, she slumped to the floor in severe shock. Her attacker hurried out of the church, under the belief that the woman was dead, but as luck would have it, she survived. When he was a safe distance away, and by his own admission, he lit the blade clean of blood. Despite her injuries, the victim was able to recall that her attacker had a red shield stitched onto his jacket, indicating to the police that he was a high school student. Detectives were perplexed by the incident, wondering who would want to harm a church-going member of the community. The second attempt happened shortly afterwards, just two days later on September 23rd. This potential victim, 78-year-old Francisco Landowska was spotted leaving a tram, then followed and stabbed in the back on the stairs leading up to the front door of her apartment. This caused her to stumble and fall down the stairs. The attacker thought his victim was dead as he quickly fled the scene. However, this attack also proved unsuccessful. The elderly woman survived, but never regained her full health, having broke her spine and her legs were left paralyzed. As with the previous incident, the victim reported to police that it was a young man who had attacked her. Both victims gave similar descriptions of the man, and police knew they were looking for a cowardly suspect who approached his victims from behind, catching them off guard. Six days later, on September 29th, the same young man struck again, only this time he would experience his first kill. 86-year-old Maria Plicto was at her local church when she was approached from behind as she walked to Jana Street and stabbed. This time the killer caused significant wounds, and before she lost consciousness, the victim managed to whisper to a nun that her attacker was a young man. Out of sight, the attacker licked the blood from the blade of his knife. Maria Plicta died the next day, while the doctors were trying to save her life. A young man visited the hospital to inquire about the victim. This curious visitor was 17-year-old Carol Cott, who would earn the nickname the Vampire of Krakow. Cott was born in Krakow on December 18, 1946, and would spend all his life in the city. Krakow had suffered greatly under the Nazi occupation of Poland, and served as a significant location for the establishment of Jewish camps, from where Jews of all ages were deported to the gas chambers of the death camps. Unlike many other Polish cities, Krakow remained relatively undamaged during the war, and was spared the destruction of the city's historical and architectural legacy. At the end of World War II, with the Nazi invaders driven out, the residents of Krakow went from one occupying force to another when the Soviet Red Army entered the city in January 18, 1945, with the new government of the Polish People's Republic, 
the city was under complete political control, and the Stalinist occupiers began the conversion of Krakow from a cultured city of learning to an industrial complex. It was from this changing landscape that Karol Koch came into the world. His father was an engineer for the Polish army and his mother a housewife. Both of his parents came from well-educated families and provided their children with a good upbringing. He was brought up along with his sister, eight years younger, by their unemployed mother, who was an activist for the League of Women. Kot was apparently a good student and had an uneventful early upbringing, until that is when he experienced what could be called a life-changing moment. One day on a family trip to Sim, a village in southern Poland, he wandered into a local slaughterhouse, where the owners allowed him to assist in the killings of farm animals. Much to their surprise, they watched in bemusement as the young boy drank from a cup of warm blood from the freshly killed animals. It was the start of what was described as odd behavior by the young cot, who began exhibiting disturbing behavior such as abusing the family cat. In his spare time, the schoolboy would busy himself by killing small animals such as a frogs, chickens and crows, before turning his attention to larger prey such as calves. It served as an escape from the taunts of his peers, who called him Lolo, Pyro, and even Sex Maniac, due to his habit of groping his female classmates. At that stage in his life, these animals were enough to satiate his burgeoning bloodlust. He started to develop an interest in the history, and in particular became a keen student of the darker history of Poland during the Nazi occupation. As a young boy, he visited Auschwitz, the death camp where millions of Jews were murdered. He was, in his own words, amazed at the organization and the idea of a concentration camp, and professed a desire to have been born during that era, so that he could have served at one. Soon enough his morbid interest in the macabre was not limited to just daydreams. He learned karate and knife throwing, hoping these pastimes would help with his aspiration of enlisting in the army. In his teenage years, Kot tried to enroll at college, but a lack of places meant he failed to be accepted. He eventually secured a place at the Technical Energy School in Krakow where he was considered a good student by teachers. During high school he joined a shooting club and quickly became his coach's star pupil, at one point ranking 10th in the Polish juniors category for the sport. The coach even gave him the role of deputy for economic affairs at the club, allowing him to carry the keys to the weapons and ammunition store. I could slay the whole of Krakow, he confided to a journalist after being apprehended. Using an air rifle that he kept in the house, Kot used to shoot meat which his mother had bought for dinner, just to test the power of the bullet. The coach trust Kot and even invited him to his house, instructing his young son to be like Carol. After his sentence was handed down in July 1967, Kot said when I read the file of the investigation and saw a letter from the coach to the Ministry of Justice, in which he protested against my arrest. I laughed sincerely. He didn't know that his son was on my execution list. It is unknown if Kot decided against murdering his coach's son or whether he was caught before he could carry out this plan. Later, when he finally realized that his favorite pupil really was responsible for committing the crimes with which he had been charged, the coach sent Kot a letter full of indignation and regret, in which he asked him to return his sportsman badge, explaining that he was unworthy of the title of athlete. He continued to harbor a fascination with the history of Nazi concentration camps, telling his interrogators after his arrest, I dreamed about mass murder in gas chambers, roundups, dividing people. I wanted to murder all women. He enjoyed collecting medical textbooks on human anatomy and toxicology, and had knowledge of forensic medicine. Did you know, he casually asked his police interrogator, that the easiest way to the heart is through the back. At home, it was difficult for his younger sister, when their parents were away he would physically and mentally abuse her. After a disappointing day at the shooting range, he would beat her to relieve his frustration, with anything from a hand strap to a belt and even with a coat hanger. Once, he almost poked her eye out. When she cried, he would lock her in a room. It was in September 1964, at the age of 17, that cop began hunting for prey larger than small animals. After two unsuccessful attacks, he finally claimed the life of Maria Puerta, and just as quickly as his rampage had begun, it stopped. While police were searching for the vampire of Krakow, Cod halted his murderous spree momentarily, and attempted a different way of claiming victims. He experimented with a variety of different methods, such as using poison and fire. He acquired some arsenic and started frequenting popular bars on the weekends, 
such as PRZY Bloniac. There where he took a bottle of vinegar from the counter, and when certain that nobody was looking, he laced it with arsenic, hoping that somebody would later use it and be poisoned, but no one did. He often left bottles of beer or soda poison with arsenic out in the open in these popular places, but nobody ever drank his poisonous mixtures. He once tried a similar attempt on a young girl he fancied at school, tempting her with a poison bottle of beer left at her door. Cot once poured a large quantity of arsenic into a schoolmate's drink, but the boy noticed a suspicious smell and refused to drink it. During his trial in the summer of 1967, expert witnesses testified that the amount of arsenic used by Cot was sufficient to kill anybody who would drink the beverage. Despite his popularity among the teaching staff at school, Cot was not so well liked by his fellow classmates. Quiet and withdrawn, he was almost morbidly shy. The only person he really trusted, and who tried to understand him and felt comfortable in his company, was Danuta W. An older girl from his sports club and a student at the Academy of Fine Arts, Kit confided all his secrets and aspirations to her, but she initially she did not take his sadistic tendencies seriously. During the period when his criminal activity went quiet, Cot took a trip to Tyniak in 1965 during which he attempted to murder his friend Danuta by putting a knife to her throat. Her reaction to this attack probably saved her life. She had laughed at Cot before calmly explaining that if he killed her, he would immediately be the main suspect. Cot also plotted four other murders, all without success, and even perpetrated several acts of arson, all of which proved unsuccessful. He had always been fascinated with fire and developed this interest by trying to set a house alight. However, when he returned to see how much damage the fire had done, he was surprised to find that there was not even smoke. In the basement of another house he set fire to some rags and loose papers, once again without success. He later tried to set fire to a wooden toilet at the shooting range, but a caretaker noticed and managed to extinguish it. Despite attempting these different methods, what Cot really enjoyed was using a blade, and his passion for blood soon resurfaced in February 1966. It was during the winter of 1966, that Cot confided to his friend Danuta that he found inflicting wounds pleasurable. This confession would later become very useful to the investigation, when Danuta raised her suspicions with the police. Thanks for watching. This has been part 1 of the Vampire of Krakow. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you'll know when we post new videos. Click the video in the bottom left to continue watching.